We have done so much with so little from so few. We made a way out of no way. But for that to persist in a nation that claims to be about equal protection under the law, that claims to be about fulfilling the promise of the Declaration of Independence for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's, it's, it's not been for us. For us, it has been hardship, horror, and hellish moments continuously. I'm Wes Kosova. Today on The Big Take, California seriously explores reparations for African Americans. For decades, African American activists and politicians have made the case for reparations to provide some measure of compensation for the legacy of slavery, racism, and discrimination in the U.S. But these efforts haven't gone anywhere. Now California is taking the argument for reparations to the next level. A state task force of economists, public policy experts, and elected officials has written a detailed draft report that attempts to quantify the costs of historical injustice. They calculate it to be as much as $800 billion. The goal of the task force is to recommend to state lawmakers who should be eligible to receive compensation of one kind or another. That big top-line number and the potential for payments to some individuals of up to a million dollars or more have gotten a lot of attention, positive and negative. And we'll get into what those numbers mean, because there's more to it than that. Part of a reparations plan and the cost wouldn't be for individuals, but to address ongoing inequality in things like education and health care. Camila Moore is an attorney and reparatory justice scholar and the chair of the task force. I'll talk with her about the challenges of trying to put a dollar figure on injustice. It's been a whirlwind of emotions. It's been very cathartic to hear from those who would be eligible, you know, descendants of slaves, for instance, who are pretty much sharing their stories to us every time we meet, pouring their hearts out about the harms and atrocities they've endured. I also speak with Bloomberg's California Bureau Chief Karen Breslau. Some of this defies numbers, and it really speaks to something of a collective atonement. She's written a deeply reported piece about the task force, and she's here to tell us how reparations would actually work. Chairperson Moore, let me just start with the most basic question. What is the case for reparations? Why should California pay them? So the case for reparations in the state of California uh, particularly is about uh, the state taking accountability for its role in perpetuating what we've called the badges and incidents of slavery that still linger on and disproportionately negatively affect African Americans, primarily those who are descendants of slaves. And so we have um, spelled out in our final report various different instances of California uh, perpetuating exclusionary public policy or widespread private discrimination as well. And um, that's what the crux of the justification for reparations in the state of California lies. And so how do you decide who should be eligible to receive compensation? So the task force, we debated around the issue of eligibility for over 10 months. And February of 2022 and March 2022, we finally came to a decision around who should be eligible, particularly for uh, monetary cash payments um, and various other forms of reparations. And we decided to base eligibility on lineage, uh, that being if you're a descendant of a free or an enslaved Black person living in the United States prior to 1900, then you would be eligible rather than you know, a race-based standard. And so it's for people who lived anywhere in the United States, not just California, which of course was not a state that sanctioned slavery. Yeah, it's for um, any person who is a descendant of an enslaved or free Black person living in the United States more broadly prior to 1900. Because a lot of Black American Californians, uh, you know, our grandparents, great-grandparents, they migrated from the South to California. 
The only part I wanted to note is around California's role in slavery. You know, a lot of people ask why California, you know, we have argued as a task force if we made the claim that California was only free in name. There were over, you know, 2,000 Black people who were enslaved in the state. Uh, Not only that, California um, implemented or enacted a fugitive slave law that was actually much more aggressive than the federal fugitive slave law. Um, That was in 1852. So that deputized ordinary white citizens to essentially round up free black people to um, re-enslave them in the South or in some instances in the state of California as well. And so it's one thing to make the argument for reparations, which has been made over the years in any number of places, and quite another thing to try to figure out how you decide who gets what. How did you go about doing that to put a dollar figure on centuries of injustice? We hired five economists and public policy experts who are at the top of their field to assist us with this question in in terms of how do you calculate um, potential compensation, uh, particularly for these, you know, decades, generations long of human rights violations, quite frankly. And so in our final report, you'll most likely see language acknowledging how it's nearly impossible to put a dollar amount on these human rights violations. But what we decided to do was to utilize these economists and public policy experts to essentially calculate the pure losses of the black community across five different state sanctioned atrocity areas. The global figure that the task force arrived at, meaning the five economists and public policy experts we hired, were able to calculate almost $800 billion in the total losses in five particular harm areas. So housing segregation, so part of that $800 billion represents the loss of home ownership value because there was state-sanctioned redlining in the state that, you know, relegated Black folks to certain neighborhoods, to certain homes. Health harms, there's an eight-year life expectancy gap between white Americans and Black Americans. So some of that $800 billion value of loss is an attempt to quantify um, that life expectancy gap. They were able to gather uh, some evidence to quantify the losses the Black community has faced over, you know, disproportionate uses of eminent domain in Black communities, over-policing and mass incarcerations took into account, for instance, loss of earning potentials and things like that. And then the fifth form, which was devaluation of Black businesses. Uh, So taking in that $800 billion amount also takes into account the losses that Black businesses have taken over time. The state task force has not recommended the state pay out $800 billion, and some news outlets have said we've recommended every Black person get paid $1.2 million. Now, that's misinformation. The monetary figures, again, just uh, represents the pure loss, economically speaking, of the Black community because of us being targeted via exclusionary public policy and widespread private discrimination. And so now it's going to be up to the state legislature to read that methodology, hopefully endorse it, but then it'll be up to them to actually prescribe the actual amount. So it could be less than what we arrived at in terms of the loss. It could be more. It could be the same. It's That's a political conversation that's best left to the legislators at this point. And so have you assigned dollar amounts for individuals to claim if they have suffered losses under one or more of these five areas? So we haven't assigned dollar amounts, but we have recommended that there be two types of forms of compensation, cumulative reparation, repertory compensation, and individual compensation. So we have uh, recommended that all folks who are eligible uh, receive reparations in the form of compensation. But in addition to that, those within the eligible class, if they can prove, so to speak, direct proof of harm in those five areas, then they should be entitled to additional compensation as well. But the dollar amounts assigned to each of those forms of discrimination are not set out in the report. There are monetary figures in the report, but they aren't dollar amounts that we're recommending per se. They represent the loss of the Black community over time based on those particular areas. 
And so those dollar figures you then think will be used by the legislature to try to come up with compensation amounts that correspond with the different forms of injustice that people suffered. Yes, exactly. And is this something that individuals will have to apply for to say, I was discriminated against in these areas and therefore I am making an application for compensation? So one of the recommendations from the task force were to create a new state agency, tentatively called the California American Freedom and Affairs Agency. And that would be the agency where people would essentially sign up to uh, receive direct repertory justice services, including showing their eligibility for um, the programs in general, but also cash payments. We invited expert witnesses around what this agency could look like, like administrative law professors, for example. And we uh, recommended that the agency have a genealogy branch uh, to assist people in showing their eligibility and then also just a general eligibility branch for those cash payments. And so that each person would come forward and make a claim and then it would be looked into and sort of investigated to see whether or not the claim was valid? Yes, absolutely. So you've been working on this for quite some time. Um, What's this been like? You've been going around the state. You've been listening to people's stories. You've heard people saying this is a great idea. You've heard vocal opposition. What is it like to head this task force? First, I'd say an honor and a privilege. You know, I went to law school with an express purpose into studying repertory justice on a domestic and international level. So I went to Columbia for my JD, and then I received a Master of Laws in International Criminal Law from the University of Amsterdam. So this was just perfect timing for me in terms of me being able to transfer my the wealth of knowledge that I have into this historic process. It's been a whirlwind of emotions. It's been very cathartic to hear from those who would be eligible, you know, descendants of slaves, for instance, who are pretty much sharing their stories to us every time we meet, pouring their hearts out about the harms and atrocities they've endured um, over time living in the state of California. You know, it's been interesting getting hate mail as well from folks who aren't very enthusiastic about it, but, you know, it all comes with the territory. So I've been having a great experience overall. (laughs) And so where does it go from here? You've written this report, you're going to deliver it, and then what happens next? So the task force, as you mentioned, uh, we have finalized uh, the report. It will be officially released at our last hearing, which will be on June 29th in Sacramento. After that, the report will be delivered to the legislators and it'll be up to the state legislator, the the state assembly and the state senate uh, to, you know, study the report in good faith, meaningfully consult with us if needed and um, implement our proposals and turn them into actual legislation. And then it'll be up to Governor Newsom to sign any reparations legislation into law. Some activists are saying that legislators can introduce reparations legislation as early as fall, winter 2023 or early 2024. And do you think this is going to be successful? Do you think California will approve reparations in one form or another? I do. I already see some conversations online from state legislators who are enthusiastic about even some of the more controversial aspects of the report. So there are legislators who literally just got elected, so they have some time to be in the legislature, which is a good thing, that are you know enthusiastic about introducing legislation for cash payments for descendants of slaves. And so I think that's a good sign to see very early on, even before the report is finalized, um, legislators willing to be bold and, you know, taking aspects of the report that some deem to be the hardest to accomplish. They're already looking into ways to partner with their other elected officials to make it a reality. And then looking further down the road, do you see your effort as a model for other states and maybe even the federal government for national reparations? I definitely see um, to the extent that states and localities uh, would like to also atone for any state or local uh, atrocities. Um, I definitely see what the state has done as a model. Um, Also in our final report, there will be a final recommendation to transmit our final report to Congress and to the Biden administration. And 
that was in our interim report, but we've kind of beefed up the recommendation to say, okay, here's our final report. You know, you can implement full reparations without a comprehensive study because California has done that work for you already. And also to the Biden administration, you can create a commission for reparations by executive order committing to full effective reparations with a truncated study period because California has done so much work on this already. So, yeah, I'm optimistic that our state has done the work to set precedent for what reparations could look like on a state level and then nationally as well. And then I'll just lastly say there have been many different people around the world from marginalized communities that have been inspired by the work of our task force and has personally reached out to me, people from you know, Namibia and Africa, Suriname and South America and so many other places who are inspired and looking to California for this work as well. Chairperson Camila Moore, thanks so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. After the break, we dig into the details of the task force's recommendations. Now let's bring in my colleague, Karen Breslau. She's Bloomberg's California bureau chief, and she's been covering the reparations task force. Karen, over the years, there have been any number of reparations efforts, but California's is different. Can you talk about why that is? So, Wes, there were policies, there were practices, there were laws uh, that codified discrimination that contributed really since the day California became a state in 1850, really up until the current day. We're very familiar with some of those having to do with discriminatory application of federal law and federal programs, going back to the New Deal, uh, the GI Bill, urban renewal projects in the 1970s in which black homes and businesses were taken through eminent domain or devalued or unjustly seized. And so there are definitely ways to track and to assign value to the wealth gap. They looked not only at wealth gaps, but also health gaps. They looked at educational gaps. They looked at harms affecting black communities in California that go well beyond numbers that don't really lend themselves to monetary compensation. And some of those have to do with intergenerational traumas. Tell us more about this task force. How did it come to be and who's in it? How does it operate? So in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder in 2020, um, a then assembly member named Shirley Weber introduced a bill to establish a reparations task force to look at not only the health, wealth, educational gaps, but also the uh, police practices and differences that led to George Floyd's murder. Shirley Weber has since been elevated to Secretary of State of California. And the task force is made up of a variety of experts. Uh, They tend to be civil rights advocates, uh, attorneys, not surprisingly, economists, a couple of members of the current legislature appointed by the governor and the speaker pro tem of the Senate. And they were given a mandate to study this issue for two years and to deliver a report to the legislature Uh, by June of this year. Karen, in your reporting, you talked to several people who are on the task force and are involved in this effort. Can you tell us about them? Yes, uh, two in particular. One is Reverend Amos Brown, who uh, is a longtime civil rights advocate in San Francisco and leads the oldest African-American congregation in San Francisco. He was born in Mississippi, in 1941, uh, the same year as Emmett Till, not far from Emmett Till. And his political awakening came when Emmett Till was murdered and he saw his photos uh, in Jet Magazine. And he went to the NAACP right there in Jackson, Mississippi, and met Medgar Evers, who was the organization's field director and went on, obviously, to have a tremendous you know, role in the American Civil Rights Movement. Amos Brown, as a young man, was mentored by Medgar Evers. He comes to it from a place of history and incredible personal connection, and he is also the descendant of a uh, great-grandfather who was enslaved in Mississippi. Let's listen to part of your interview with him. California and San Francisco are not squeaky clean. Even in 1908, 
uh, Reverend Allen Allensworth tried to establish a community down there near Bakersfield that became known as Allensworth. The water was poisoned. The politicians were able to get the railroad track rerouted to kill the town. So it looks like every time we make progress in spite of, of what we have been able to achieve, there is this alliance of a movement to say, no, you're not going any further. We're going to stop you. If it means suppressing the vote, if it means unjust police practices, if it means making sure that you don't get equality of opportunity for employment, if it means that you don't get health care. Those who are handicapped, we got measures through Congress. So wherever a particular group or population has been wronged, we made efforts. You know, if a tornado comes through the land and tears up the community, we make funds available to help businesses. We all receive help. None of us lives by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And so you've described the various ways that the task force has tried to quantify all the various legacies of racism. How do they go about doing that? Well, let's take an example, home ownership. They can track rates of home ownership through a variety of federal and state data over time. They can look at lending practices. They can look at the actual mechanism of redlining. And so another thing the task force did was to look into historical examples of reparations on very large scales. Germany's reparations to Israel after the Holocaust. More recently, the 9-11 Victims' Compensation Fund. They looked at, uh, if you want examples of wrongdoing by the U.S. government, the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. The U.S. government compensated the survivors of the Tuskegee syphilis study on black men by the U.S. Public Health Service, and that continued, if you can believe it, until 1972. So there are definitely uh, historical frameworks here. There's also an entire you know, body of international law and standards set forth by the United Nations, and all of that factored into their report. In your story, you write that after the task force started doing all of this work, they did come up with hard numbers for any number of things. Can you just run through what some of these numbers are that spell out what people are owed? One calculation looked at the statistical value for a year of human life, and they looked at the differences in life expectancy affecting Black Californians and came up with a value of $13,619 per statistical year of missing life expectancy. Uh, another was wealth missing due to lower rates of black home ownership, $148,099. The average devaluation of a black owned business, $77,000. For each year of disproportionate incarceration factored by race, combining lost wages and freedom, $159,792. What they're doing here is preparing recommendations that are going to go to the legislature so that the lawmakers can have a frame of reference, can have some data to set up a reparations framework. And so where would that revenue come from? Would they raise taxes? Would it come from specific places? One proposal that a member of the task force made, who's uh, Stephen Bradford, a state senator, is to set aside 0.5% of the state's operating budget into an annuity, which would create about a billion and a half dollars in annual funding. And some of these reparations do not have monetary value attached. Uh, some include something like an official apology by the state of California or discounted tuition or free tuition to eligible descendants of enslaved people who want to go to the University of California or any public university. Greater health care, greater investments in health care. What's the public's response been to the idea of reparations in California? It's been very divided, not only by party, 
with Democrats who have an overwhelming majority in the state legislature and also, you know, among voters, I think open to the concept, but very fuzzy on the details. And then there are those who are opposed to the concept of reparations, that current generations should essentially pay the tab for generations past. I think we're going to see a lot of movement in public opinion as this task force report gets studied and discussed in the legislature. Public opinion can move pretty quickly, but both the concept of reparations and the staggering totals are going to give a lot of people pause. When you say public opinion is going to move, which direction do you anticipate it would move in? I think it will move with understanding that reparations doesn't always mean a check. We saw that with the Japanese-American internment. Those survivors were compensated with $20,000, which could not come close to the suffering and the losses and led to an apology by the U.S. Congress and led to a, the funding of a number of public education initiatives. When we come back, we hear from another member of the task force. Earlier, we heard Reverend Amos Brown, and other members of the task force also told their stories. The other amazing story was Reggie Jones-Sawyer, who's a member of the uh, State Assembly from Los Angeles. And his family came from Arkansas, from Hope, Arkansas. He is related to one of the Little Rock Nine. Karen sat down with the assemblyman. Let's hear part of their conversation. You know, ever since I was a little boy, I used to hear stories about my uncle being one of Little Rock Nine, one of the nine kids that integrated Central High School in 1957. I used to hear stories of him being beaten and kicked, all sorts of disparaging names, just for him to try to get into high school. There's a picture of him standing next to a fence pole, and he's by himself, and across the street you can see the angry white mobs yelling at him. One day they forgot to pick him up from school. So they all got in the car, raced down there, and he was standing next to this post. And they went, when it got to him, he had spit, somebody urinated on him. I mean, it was pretty bad. And we'd asked him what happened. And he said that the kids swarmed, the white kids just went around him and just called him names. Martin Luther King and Reverend Lawson had taught him nonviolence, not to get, let anybody see you panic. And uh, he said, in the middle of the crowd, this young kid came out and said, hey, leave him alone. He's not doing anything. And he said, and then they dispersed. He said he saw the kid the next day, thanked him and said, wow, you're really, you know, your parents raised you right. That was a really Christian of you. And the kid looked at him. He said, we're atheists. I just did it because it was the right thing to do. The barriers that those nine kids went through I don't know if I could have gone through all of that with all that I know now at my age, if I could have gone through that kind of trauma at that age. Um, but I owe them a debt of gratitude because if it wasn't for them, I had absolutely no problem of getting into the University of Southern California. And now I'm in the doctoral program at SC. And it's because of them, I was able to fulfill my academic dreams with absolutely no problem whatsoever. And so I'm, I'm standing on their shoulders. And so when this opportunity came up, I realized it's really important that I do everything I can um, to reverse what institutional slavery has done to African-Americans, not only in America, but let's start here in California. You know, when we, when we talk about history and trying not to repeat history, when we talk about critical race theory, um, which is really about telling the truth of history and what really happened, not what was whitewashed, but what really happened. Uh, and what you'll find is not only were there governors who actively worked to send slaves back to the South here from California, that there were laws that prohibited African-Americans from marrying outside their race, that there were laws that were put in place so that we couldn't live in areas that we wanted to, um, that the GI Bill restricted us, even though we went to war, fought for this country, and laid our lives down, that we didn't have the same opportunities as, as our white counterparts um, to, to the GI Bill and education and things of nature, and that California participated in it 
just as much as they did in the South. We may be the benchmark, not only for California on what reparations will be or should be, but the nation and any city or state in this country will then take all this data and use it as the floor <laughs> for what they will or will not do in the future. That is an unbelievable responsibility. I don't think it's about paying. It's about reversing the harms that are now placed upon Af every African-American in California. If you can stop redlining and you can do it with, without any financial responsibility, without having to implement any money, I think that, that works just as well. If we're talking about education, um, if somehow we can make schools equal in the inner cities for, for African-American kids who are performing at a lower level. If we can level that playing field in a way that is not uh, overly burdensome on the, on the uh, educational budget, then l let's do that. It's more important to have success than to spend money when it comes to mass incarceration. Uh, I have a bill right now where if you close two prisons, it's a savings of $230 million a year. What if we could plow that money back into recidivism programs, uh, mental health programs? We could pour it back into trauma-informed care because a lot of kids see things on the street that then get them into the school to prison pipeline. Then we save $80,000 a year to $100,000 a year incarcerating people. And that's money that we save, which means that's not an extra burden on us. We're now working on the savings and we're looking at an ROI, return on our investment. What if we start looking at it that way? Yes, on the ledger, it may look like it's $231 million that we're spending, but we're really not. This is the money we save. What if that $230 million turn into, we close 10 prisons instead of two? How much savings is that over a long period of time that we could say was part of reparations, mm -hmm. reducing the amount of people mm -hmm. who are recidivating, going back and forth like a turnstile into prison? How much money could we save there? Now, now we're talking about a robust system that does look like it's billions and billions of dollars, where it really is billions and billions of savings. Everybody's basing everything on money. I think changing policy is just as important as the financial remuneration. In fact, I think if we are to remove some racial disparity barriers, they will go a lot further than cash payments. Karen, do you think ultimately there will be some form of reparations at the end of this long process? I do, Wes. I think it's going to be a range of monetary and non-monetary measures. I think the public apology will come rather soon. I think public education programs will come soon. I think the notion of greater investment in health, access to higher education, into home ownership programs, I think all of that is readily within reach. I think the concept of individual compensation remains distant, and I don't expect that for years. Karen, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Thank you, Wes. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Bergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Mo Barrow and Michael Falero. Rafael M. Seeley is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidron. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back on Monday with another Big Take. Have a great weekend.